Kelly, welcome to Merck TV and thanks for inviting us to the New South Wales RNA Institute. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, welcome. Yes, um, I hope you enjoy your day here at the UNSW RNA Institute. We are here to learn all about you and help our, um, our Australian researchers and, and researchers all around the world and the lay people find out about Pally Thordeston. So, how did you get here, Pally? Uh, that's a really good question, uh, which I still don't have an answer for. <laughs> I'm not born here. I'm born in Iceland on a farm in the northeast corner of the country. I ended up in a university there, and we can come back to that if we want. But uh, even after cl completing my undergrad degree there, I was certainly not planning to go to Australia. That somewhat ha happened for reasons I still cannot explain. I, the best I can explain it is that at some point after finishing my PhD, uh, undergrad there, I started working at the local research institute and I started enjoying doing research so I got it in my head I might want to do a PhD. I started investigating different options, America, Germany, Britain, Scandinavia and for some reason, yeah, let's look also at Australia and New Zealand and I, that's the bit I don't understand why I was looking at that but long story short and the world is really small when I talked to my supervisor and I mentioned that to him he said oh I know this person in Sydney why don't you contact him which I did and then a week later I get a, a phone call in the lab and a pack basically an offer to come to Australia and, <laughs> and I decided to take it I probably didn't really think it through so you took a risk mm -hmm. and you, you came to Australia it's something that not all scientists are capable of but you did it no regrets so far you've started to establish some of the first ever RNA manufacturing facilities yeah, in Australia yeah, yeah. yeah one of the first in Australia and especially focusing uh, uh, sort of on the, almost the whole scale yes mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and we're not obviously going to do that all here but uh, part of it is done with uh, industry partners uh, and the government. But yeah, taking risk, yeah, no, when you say it, look, maybe I've always been a bit of a risk taker. Um, um, one of the things I actually remember now enjoying when I came down here and, uh, and traveling, in particular, over across the ditch with our neighbors was uh, extreme sports like skydiving and stuff. So yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's... You're a keen skydiver? No, 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 no. I mean, I just like, I've only done this once. This sort of stuff I like doing once or twice, and then, yeah, okay, that's okay. cool. But I mean, when I ended up here, then I also got dragged into, kind of by accident, into the field of um, prebiotic chemistry, understanding how life originated. And that's actually where the spark for RNA came from. I never worked on RNA in those times, but I got familiar with the RNA world hypothesis that RNA played a key role in the evolution of the prebiotic soup of chemicals into. To what we call life, uh, that RNA was probably the key molecule in that process. Mm -hmm. And I ever always want to come back to that, and that's sort of why then I saw the link between what's going on in RNA and biology and these gels we were working on, which sort of came back into that. And then I was really fortunate, we hired here a very young, uh, sorry, a very talented young chemist uh, as an academic, Albert Fahrenbach, and he had a back background in RNA synthesis and brought that set up a lab to do that here and I started collaborating with him so mm -hmm. to be able to do that RNA synthesis and that was a key moment sort of my own own research be able to start to work on RNA with Albert. Yeah right you just said chemical soup mm -hmm. I have never heard this term before. Well, I... This is the hypothesis as soon as the, uh, the molten earth froze we can use that term uh, you had some areas on the planet probably land-based where there were there was a cocktail of, of molecules formed by all sorts of weird gas chemistry, you know, the famous Miller-Urey experiment and all that. And somehow out of that soup, a few hundred million years later, we have the first living uh, uh, bacteria-like organism, right? Uh, what happened in between? is one of the biggest challenges in science, right? Yeah. And <laughs> RNA plays almost certainly have a key role in that. Yeah. Uh, evolution of that chemical soup into what we recognize as life. I'm going to forever remember this interview with that term, <laughs> prebiotic chemical soup. Yep. It's, a, it's a great term to kind of describe the origins of life. Yes, yes. <laughs> so so yeah. the origins of life, protecting life and ensuring we have um, human health, mm. um, you know, it's... it's they all intersect in RNA. It all intersects yeah. in RNA. And yeah. it, you know, as a, as scientists, we we are a, a trying to answer questions to to create health and, and mm -hmm. solve the world's problems about life. Yeah. 
this institute, the work you're doing, mm -hmm. the the chemical soup of people that you're bringing in around you is is on the the precipice of potentially solving some of the biggest kind of questions we have around trying to prolong life. Yeah. What is it do, that you think that RNA is capable of in the next 30, 50 years? Yeah. Now, that's a really good question. At the health front, I think, yes, so there's already, as I say, we got the vaccines already, and there are treatments using either CRISPR technology, which is largely RNA-based, or, or uh, silencing RNAs to treat rare genetic disorders. This is what we're doing already, right? Yeah. Uh, cancer vaccines, I think, are very close to uh, being realized. Uh, cancer vaccines are not going to be a, a silver bullet for cancer, but they will be another very valuable tool in the battle against cancer. The real frontier is probably in neurological uh, conditions. If, as many of the people who work in RNA biology say, that, our, our, like again, RNA is not only a critical element to all cell development and cell function, but in a particular in the brain, then the next step from there is that as we understand the role of RNA in the brain, that means we might get closer to both treating neuro neurodegenerative diseases, which again, some people now say the infamous amyloid theory, which is under a lot of strain. The pharmaceutical companies have spent an uh, enormous amount of money chasing after with no success. Mm -hmm. One reason might be that the role of RNA protein interactions in the cell in the brain is overlooked mm -hmm. and that's where you need to start if you want to treat diseases like Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. If that's true, then obviously that will solve that problem then in, in a few decades time. Yeah. And then other people argue that you come to other conditions, you know, uh, some of the psychological disorder that uh, many people battle you could also possibly treat them mm -hmm. by modulating RNA activity in some way or yep. misregulation or regulation yep. in the brain. So that's one of the big, you know, 30 to 50 year horizon uh, frontiers, I think, for RNA researchers, whether they come from chemistry, biology or medicine or engineering. Yeah, and I think it's a really nice time to be in science because the, um, the different work streams are coming together mm. more and more and it's not this lab does chemistry, this lab does protein work and that's your microbiology lab. Yep. Everybody's getting together at the table now yep. to solve the same problem but yep. coming at it from different angles with, with lots of different ideas and it's a really great place to be right now for a scientist. I mean and, and, like, and, and one of the things just to say we will be doing synthetic RNA here for, here for a few years when we set up the institute now we started doing mRNA, that was new for me. I love it because um, you start off making plasmid in E. coli, so it's like pure bioreactors, and then you isolate that, and you, st you do an enzyme reactor, so it was a cell-free, and then you move down into chromatography processes, and you end up doing things which are almost chemicals, right? Yeah. So you're doing all the way from you know, growing some bugs in a pocket to, um, to then mixing it in with lipids in ethanol and water, right, to make the lipid nanoparticles. Yeah. Fascinating, like, <laughs> oh, spectrum. The way you just described it then, I I actually felt like you were at the farm, kind of going from bucket to bucket to bucket to bucket. <laughs> it is a bit, yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, coming back to a very original point, how did I end up here? I, I, uh, you, you hit a, um, um, a soft spot there. I, I grew up on a farm. Uh, I do think that has somewhat some to do with both my view of life, uh, how I approach this work, why I ended up in this job. I mean, there was a one point too, like, I didn't actually decide till somewhere between halfway in my PhD that I might want to become an academic. I was always thinking I was end up in industry. Okay. <clears throat> but one reason why I started liking the idea of being an academic was that it's not a nine to five job. <laughs> as much as I'm okay with the idea of a nine to five job, it's, it isn't really whatever anyone says. Like now, we all need to try to balance work and life and that's, and I think there was a somewhat uh, toxic culture developing within academia a few years ago where that work-life balance had gone a little bit too far into the work dimension. Setting that aside, it's still not a nine-to-five job. It's a little bit more like farming. It goes a bit up and down. <laughs> and it's also like farming that you write a grant application, you don't get a paper to two, three years later if you fund it, right? Uh -huh. uh, it's the same, you throw a fertilizer on the ground, if you're an animal farming like we were on where I grew up, you know, you don't take the um, the, um, the animal to the 
to the aperture and get the money back till two years later. Uh -huh. yeah? uh -huh. it, it's a long cycle. Yeah. You need to think very far ahead. Yeah? Patience. And yeah, fill a lot of different buckets, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good business. It's, it's, you have to be persistent and patient. Yeah. Those, those two things I think are really important in science uh, because it is a long game in yeah. those cases. Yes. Yeah. Well, they do say patience is a virtue, so I want to say thank you for being patient with me as I come up to speed with the chemical processes of RNA, but thank you very much for having us here today and for sharing your story. Thank you, Sarah. I really enjoyed this. Mm -hmm. Thank you.